Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, today we are doing a panel discussion called Creative Town Small Business. Uh, I will be moderating this one. So if you're any interested in asking any questions and you're social media savvy, uh, you can hashtag revolve underscore CC uh, and we will uh, try to answer it on the stage. Uh, afterwards, we will have a mic too, so if you're not a social media person, that's perfectly fine if you wanna have some questions uh, and answered uh, the old-fashioned way with a microphone. Um, that is cool too. So without any ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our three panelists. Uh, we did a good job of trying to get, from a visual perspective, a, a 3D, a 2D, and a digital artist, so we have a good um, background here. And each of them has over 10 years of experience owning their own business in Marquette. Um, so I want to uh, introduce Ben Johnson, owner designer of Elegant Seagulls, Beth Milner, owner designer of Beth Milner Jewelry, and Dan Pimble, owner of an artist of Sacred Tattoo. So I'll play their video. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> I, I've known all of these people for quite some time, so this will be very amusing. Um, so we'll start with asking how you guys got your start. So we'll start alphabetically um, with Ben. Like, where did you get your start? How did you want you choose Marquette? What do you do? So those of you who might not know. Um, well. You're still there, except you own it now. And how many years have you each owned your own business? Um, I started in 2007, so 12 years? Uh, I'm not good at math, but it's been 13 years. 10. 10. So, so each, we have over almost 35 years of exper collective experience here. So, you know, yeah, so um, <laughs> kudos. Um, so we do have a few questions here that we got off the um, off the uh, the interwebs here, and I'll be looking for any others that might uh, come in as we go. So if I'm totally checking my phone, I'm not or anything like that. <laughs> so um, um, so how did you Um, and so, you know, at our fair, 30,000 people might walk past you in a weekend and kind of collecting the, the contact info of the ones who were interested or made purchases. Um, and also, Facebook business pages became a thing pretty much at the beginning of my business. And so, making sure I was posting on social media um, and, and kind of getting that engagement, things have changed quite a bit in that, that realm, but there's a lot of organic reach online, and I did blogging too. How did you uh, find those art fairs when you were initially starting out? Oh, that's a good question. I asked other artists. Um, I did a lot of research online. Um, I went to music festivals, but it was really a lot of networking to find out what's a good show, what's not a good show. I definitely tried a lot that weren't that good, and then I made sure to start kind of asking people what's a good show. Um, okay. Um, I think for me, it was just starting local. We had like local clients, and then it was just trying to always over deliver and kind of going above and beyond what they'd asked for. And then that just over delivery and putting out really quality work just kept trickling to bigger and bigger and bigger clients. Um, and that took a lot of time. I mean, it wasn't like overnight all of a sudden we were doing stuff for ESPN and Forbes and things like that. It, that took eight years to get to that point, but it was that constant push of like trying to put out the best work we could and kind of never settling. So besides like the obvious of like social media uh, or like winning awards or being active in like the design community and on like um, 
Dribble, which is like a social network for designers. Um, all those things kind of like play in part, but for us, a lot of it was like also relationship based. Mm -hmm. So like you're gonna have clients that you maybe work with at company X, and then three years later, they work at a different company, and they're like, oh, I really like those guys from Elegant Seagulls. They were rad to work with. They did a great job, and they were on time and on budget, and we should work with them. And then that turns into another thing, and so you get these projects that just continue to go through. So I think as you get more involved in your career, it's, it's really like relationship based, and so like not burning those bridges and kind of like that over delivering has been a cornerstone for, for us. Sure. Yeah, I think it starts local. Well, often starts small and grows. I think much like that, the timing was, was really, um, it was helpful that this new age of social media was really on the rise as, as my career was getting started. And so um, the way the information travels and the way that you're able to market yourself now is so different than ever before. And so that can certainly be a great tool, but I think um, always focusing on, on your kind of your bread and butter clients are, is also super important. So um, pairing off that, was there any pitfall uh, situations you ran into dealing with social media? Did you all kind of mention that um, as an idea of something that happened that you went, whoa, that just did not go right, um, or, or, or something along those lines? Yeah. Not been I, I think it's just kind of like, I had to always like check myself and be like, should I post this? Because things like I might have thought were hilarious. It's just <laughs> like, maybe like it, like in the different context, it wasn't funny to like, and I've, it, it never really happened to me or my company, but I, I saw other people mm -hmm. that put stuff out that like probably was tongue in cheek, but it really like disrupted their careers and they got a lot of flack. Um, so I always had to just be like, okay, is this gonna upset anyone? Um, and just kind of be careful just because it, it could definitely disrupt. I think as visual artists, we need to be careful of, of kind of, with social media, um, this kind of echo chamber we can, we can really easily fall into where you're getting a lot of yes men telling you how great your stuff is. Almost like the reviews and stuff that got brought up earlier, these likes and these clicks and these things can be so gratifying, but you're like, by who? By these, this small group of people who just continue to tell you yes? There's no like, no dislike button on there, or no, well, maybe you should have tried this button, or could, it, could you have done that better? Um, maybe so media don't invent that. Con it, it's so easy to go and get that dopamine feed of, of gratification because you have a couple people on there telling you that your stuff's cool, and well, I hope it is. <laughs> yeah, maybe we need to do like the next dribble and like actually have that like suggest different yeah, suggestions and stuff. Well, it's also not so when you don't get it, you don't get the response, then is it like crush you and make you feel like you're not up to snuff? Or yeah, that? or starting where you could get a lot of organic traffic and then all of a sudden you realize that you're not, and then it's it's not you actually, it's the algorithm. Um, or I talked in a, for a minute as a question before we were talking about reviews this morning and how for a minute in time Facebook had it so your, your five star rating was the first thing a customer would see and people would accidentally touch the wrong star. I knew it. It was good clients. They liked us, but they accidentally clicked one star. And so that you're kind of at the whim of someone else's potentially bad design of a platform when you're using it as a way to drive, drive people, good or bad. Mm -hmm. Dan, have you ever considered doing Ink Masters? Oh my gosh, no. I love Ink Masters, <laughs> and I always, I like, I'm obsessed with it, because I think it's just super creative, and I'm always asking Dan if he's gonna do it. I, there's, there's no faster <laughs> way to ostracize yourself from the tattoo industry than to go on Ink Master. <laughs> um, it's you, fun to watch. You know what, Bef <laughs> before it was a show, and I was seeing the platform in other areas, like. Like, uh, I liked the, what was the design one? Sheer Genius, is that what it was yeah, called? Yeah, the interior design one? No, it was uh, like fashion design. Oh, okay. Oh, um, I think it was Project, Project Runway. Project Runway? Or? Project Runway, yeah. yeah. I like that one too. There was that, <laughs> and there was like a cooking one too, and I'm like, this platform would work for tattooing, and I, I always fancied myself a bit of a, of a being, you know, good at multiple genres and styles, and I'm like, I bet I'd be pretty good at that. Yeah, and then it became a thing, I was like, look at that, and then within like a, season or whatever you're just like it can be a slippery slope nope. because they start to cultivate the drama oh, instead man. of in, uh, yeah, lifting up the art and that that's um not what i'm about i'm <laughs> sure any industry can say that though you're like 
they you watch it and you're like, this is not representational of my industry at all. Uh -huh. But you also need to remember that I am not their target audience, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm a tattooer. I, I'm not who they're trying. Yeah, yeah. Person. I'm not who they're trying to appeal to at all. Yeah, I know they had one for design very, very briefly, very briefly. I think <laughs> it fizzled out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so moving on, I have a question from the interwebs. Nice. Um, so uh, this is from Jalen. Sorry over there. Um, can you explain the leap from startup business to established and having a regular income? Oh, that's a good question. Um, in the beginning, I did it on a total shoestring. We lived in a cabin off the grid where my partner Mike traded his labor for our rent, and I scraped by paying my student loans, and we made all of our food from scratch and tried to really just save and pinch penny pinch as much as possible. I realize it's not the same opportunity for everybody, but that's that's how we did it, was like really um, not spending money as much as we possibly could until we could again. Uh, I think for me, part of it was just being like young and naive, and like I had a computer <laughs> and I liked design, and I was like, I'll just do this. Um, and I, I don't want to say more can, it was kind of more making a job for myself at the time. It wasn't, I didn't have set up to have an agency and to have 13 plus employees. Um, it was just me and my computer. Um, and I think looking back, if I like, would I have done it? I would have hoped I'd still do it, but it's like, I don't know. It took a long time to kind of like get over that hump. Um, Big leap of faith when you're young and it's, it seems easier when you don't have as many obligations in life when you come off of being a, a student and you're kind of maybe, for me at least a broke student, right? And there was no risk. I didn't borrow money in the beginning. I just, what, I wouldn't get a waitress again if it didn't work. Yeah, and I think you gotta be committed to it. Like, if you're gonna make the leap, like, I remember going to, like, the Builder Show and was like, do you guys need websites? Like, just going to every single person there. And, like, it was just boots to the ground. Awesome. Just getting, I mean, doing stuff for friends and family and um, just putting out work. And then just slowly but surely, I got busy enough where, like, I can't do all this work. And then I hired my first employee. And then I kept going and just, as I hit a wall, I just kept hiring, kept hiring, kept hiring. Um, so it, was, it wasn't like a stage plan. Like now we more have like a plan like, okay, like in the next five years, I want to hire the next employees, and these are the employees I want to hire. Uh, at the start, it was just like, I've got too much work, I'll hire someone. That was that the was mindset. The same too. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I mean, this is the age old question of any creative industry is, is how do we balance our creativity with monetary gain, right? It's, it's you either sell out and you're this person or you're. You're this core dude and you're poor and you live, you know, in the woods and you're trading, you know, your services for food. So I think we all struggle with that at some point. You're like, where does my creativity get stifled in my pursuit for stability? Um, and we all have to kind of find where that line is for us individually. Um, I also am a firm believer that if if the product is there, the uh, the, the latter will follow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like I think coming to this, I was thinking about you know who, who my audience would be and who would be here and stuff. And I think a real honest conversation to have too is, what is your product? Um, because if it's not quality, I don't want to be telling you that if yeah, you just got to be hitting that social media a little harder. You just got to be you know saving those ramen noodles and everything's going to be okay. Like the product needs to be sound, and if if it is, then all these other things will fall in line. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, I really knew that I could be better, and in the beginning I just I knew I had to get better, but also from the customer perspective, I under-promised and over-achieved, which kind of echoes what you were saying about just you know going above and beyond, because you never want to over-promise and under-achieve. That is like the biggest thing to avoid. Yeah, we've learned that on the conference. <laughs> when I first started moving back to Marquette, and I wanted to start out in Seagulls, and it was, it was more for a job for myself, but I looked at all the, and this is no knock on what was happening in the area at the time, but I was like, you know, I don't think that the website's being created and, the, and some of the work creatively was where it should be or what I would want to see for a small town. And so I was like, I can do better. And so like, it was kind of like setting my flag as like, I'm gonna make this work better. And then I think it just resonated with, um, with my clients. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience to that too. I, I imagine maybe you as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think 
Sometimes you hear a business plan, whether it be creative or otherwise. Oh, fuck. Okay, you just cool. Kind of scratch your head. <laughs> Good luck. <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, we're at a creative conference, so it's easy to direct it into that. Where you're like, what's your product? You're like, well, I make, you know, I'm making belly button clothes. <laughs> you know, whatever, just some random thing. You're like, I hope that works. Like, yeah, there's so many ideas out there, but the having something that people really want and doing it better than you anything you've seen. Now, that may sound a little egotistical, but you have to aim for better than anything you've seen um, because that's how you make it a really good product or um, final outcome. Well, I think it's to uh, add that, I can say that both people on both my sides have continued to push themselves even though they're successful. I mean, I know, I'm a lot closer with Dan. Dan will go back way too long. Dan will have stories about that he should not tell and vice versa. Um, but like, I know Dan is always working on his craft and always pushing it better. And always, and, and I think that's the same thing. So I think even though you reach a certain level of success, you know, you can't stop. Can't you can't be comfortable. Um, I'm always trying to one up from design. Yeah. Like better, like look at what was good last time and make it better. Yeah. I think, I think you're, Defining success is also really important. Like, what is your what is, what is your definition of success? Because that can look very different to a lot of different people. Success to some people would be, you know, the guys banging on instruments in the other room have a much different idea than maybe somebody else here. Um, you know, success to me is 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 balance. It's being able to be a great father first and foremost, and a great spouse and. Uh, be able to be a creative, like all of these things that are on my plate, that you're, you're, you're spinning the plates, right? Keeping these things balanced, but I think defining what success is to you is important, not looking up here and saying, oh, these guys made it up here because they're successful, and you're like, what does that even mean? Yeah, yeah I mean, we do sometimes get into the either the monetary or we get into the fame aspect of it, and so I think we sometimes forget about the, I do think that's one thing the millennials uh, age is really focused on, is that work-life balance idea, um, which sometimes I think even, I, I can safely say we're all pretty close of generation, um, the Gen X, or however you wanna call it, late millennial, sometimes we forget, and we work a 60-hour week, or. Um, yeah, that can be a struggle to create that work-life balance. It took me two years in the beginning of working every day before I realized that the breaks were just as important as the work, um, and that that's it's almost counterintuitive to logic. But if that downtime, if anybody was in the last talk about how the brain works, she kind of talked about that as well. You need those times to actually let those ideas develop. Um, but it, when you got a lot of work, it can be hard to to work a normal amount. Um, but recognizing it and, and step, stepping back and letting yourself take those breaks is is really important. So uh, a question, follow-up question from that, and then I'll, I'll get back to the script at once, I swear, um, is uh, all of you, I think I've talked to all of you personally at some point about this, uh, how do you feel about just still getting your hands dirty? Like, how often does that happen? How much does, does the day-to-day -day managing of your business either interfere, or does it help, or how does that work for you? Like, administrative stuff versus... Yeah, or managing employees and things like that. Things we do all day versus what we do all day. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, 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 went through, I went through a phase where, to be honest, I was I was not being creative and I wasn't designing. And I think it's probably like the most burnt out and over it I was. I was like, why am I doing this? And and maybe it was the most successful time of the business. We, we were making lots of money and things were going smooth. But uh, I was I wasn't happy. And so I made the conscious decision to hire people to do all the stuff I didn't want to do um, <laughs> that were better at it than I was. Uh, and that was like a real growth spurt. <clears throat> For the organization to like realize like I can't do everything like and I can't be, have my hands in every single piece and I say the last couple of years it's been even a bigger jump like I oversee all the creative but I might be like yeah that looks great or I might be like this isn't working we gotta start over so everything has to go through me as a gatekeeper but I'm not involved in every single project anymore um, but I also now took all that time that I was doing administrative stuff and now I'm being creative so like I still design myself and our art director, we do all the concepting. And maybe from a financial standpoint, that might not make the most sense, but for me, it's the most rewarding. It's why I love what I'm doing, so like I can't give that up. Whether I have yeah. 10 or 100 employees, I want to still do that. But it's at a cost, so yeah. you guys, are, you, know, you might be out there going, oh, that sounds nice, you just hire somebody to do the <laughs> stuff you don't want to do. 
but that's coming at a cost to him. And the thing that's hard to put a monetary value on is peace of mind. Mm -hmm. For myself, I, I'm not good in certain areas, and so I surround myself with people who are, that are, who are strong or I am weak, and that costs money. And on paper, you know, the, you're given to an accountant, you're like, well, on paper, this doesn't make sense because you could have done these things. Labor and you're like, is too high. <laughs> the, the, the accountant's like, you labor ratio is too high. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, it's hard to monetize uh, or put a monetary value on peace of mind, on mental health, on stress, and the, the, the lack thereof. And so, yeah, we, we have a, a shop manager who does a brilliant job, and without him, I would be a mess. Uh, on that note, getting back to the other half of this, the idea of the small town. So what special challenges have you run into having a creative business in a, not in a big city, perhaps, in a smaller town? I mean, seasonality, I think that would happen in any sort of um, jewelry business that does a lot of gifts. But I think it's the bigger we grow, the more we feel the seasonality. And so that is, is interesting to keep people employed throughout the year at a decent wage. And, and like deal with the slower times of the year and what we do to try and build those to try and even it out a little bit. Um, so that, that can be a little bit hard, but the internet helps with that too. Um, yeah, I'd say for us, it's, it hasn't really hurt us very much. I mean, almost all of our clients are all over the, all over the world in reality. Um, and the internet and Zoom and things like that make it super easy. And most of the clients don't care where you are. The only time it does hurt us is some of like the big companies in the Bay um, they're like, they'll reach out to us for a potential project. They're like, let's do lunch tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, mm. <laughs> uh, what do you want me to order? Yeah, like I'll be here. But um, so like we probably do miss out on some opportunities to like face to face with some like those companies that just don't, they want you to be there then. Um, but for the majority of clients, like they don't, they don't care. I mean, it, the internet makes it so easy for our, for our side, all digital based. Mm -hmm. And mine's obviously different because you need the person is going to be there. But honestly, you guys, regardless, the, the thing that a small town offers that maybe a bigger one doesn't is actually a lot. Marquette, if you've lived here or spent any amount of time here, I assume you have, is its own ecosystem. Like, geographically, economically, we have a big bullseye on Marquette, and the scope of that is so big, and all of those people from that surrounding area are completely fine with getting in their car and driving two hours to Marquette. Because they're doing it. They're doing it for doctor's appointments, mm -hmm. and for shopping, and for a million other things, so they don't think anything of it to have to jump in their car and drive an hour and a half. If you live in metro Chicago, you're not going to drive an hour and a half across and pass 90 tattoo shops to go to mine when there's, you know, th that many right there. So. You have a lot of things working for you that um, specific to maybe market. I don't think it maybe is true small town. I everywhere. think it's the population size and the type of people that are here because you know if you can engage the community with your business or with things your business does, you can create a, a name here. And I think I can't imagine creating a name in Chicago. Right. I just I don't know how hard that would be. It would be a lot more about how good your marketing and branding is, which is important to any business. But I think, you know, reaching out in the community, we have a fundraiser program that we do in my shop and those things where we, we try to give back so that they they want to give to us. It's a it's a give and take where you, you can interact in a community and of this size that's that's a it's like a perfect sized town to get the word out um, yeah. and have people know you. And you don't have to have a million dollars to get your foot in the door. You try mm -hmm. opening a, a storefront in downtown and Chicago. Buying a building, in know. downtown Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Because we just realized right before this that all of you own your own building in town now. Yeah, which is, is pretty cool um, to be able to do that, I mean, is a, a great opportunity. Something that happened for me is I didn't have what I needed to buy the building, so I only had a small portion of the down payment. And I worked with Northern Initiatives, which is um, they lend to people, I like to put it this way, they don't brand this way, but that almost could have gotten a bank loan. And so I was really close to being, be, being lendable to buy the building, but I wasn't exactly there. And so you have to have 20% down to buy commercial property and I only had 5% and Northern Initiatives made up that other portion. And so a lot of people don't know about community service lending and I, I feel a big token of gratitude to that organization because that really allowed me to, to get my foothold and own a building um, downtown too. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I'm gonna move on to some of the prescriptive questions, but this has been fantastic so far. Um, so one of the questions, I kind of altered this one slightly from Joy Bender Hadley. Um, if a new support businesses came into town, what would creatives and businesses hope for in an offering? She was specifically talking about print shops, but I want to open it to any support businesses. Um, like business to business support, like other yeah. organizations. Business you know, things business. that provide you tools or opportunities or, to, or equipment um, or, uh, you know, ways to get other materials. You know, something like maybe somebody runs a social media campaign aspect and does, takes that off your plate. Something along those lines. What would you want to see uh, in Marquette? It's an interesting question because there's a lot of people who do subcontracted work related to businesses in this town. So it's, yeah. I think we're all stewing on. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of Office Max. Ooh. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Rip. <laughs> Uh, I think that's where the print shop question's coming from, to be honest. Uh, I think we might need a new place. I know my students do. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, yeah. Okay. yeah I mean, there's a lot of places that are, mm -hmm. it's, it, you hope would stay open. I, I mean, like, Office Max, even though I was half joking, I mean, I still get tons of stuff there mm -hmm. all the time for, like, if I'm going to meetings, I need decks, I need whatever. Like, I'm not going to print that. We don't even, I don't know if we have a printer in my office, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Which is sad. <laughs> We're very digital. Um, so, like, I think some of those things, there's are a lot of support for those pieces. Um, as far as, like, marketing and things like that, I don't know if we would have anything that's particular. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I think the print shop thing could be really important. Um, we work with Pride Printing a lot. Um, yes, they were one of our sponsors. They're, they're great. They've been fantastic, by the way. Yeah, but I do think that, they, you know, they do have to send some things out, too. So maybe there's, you know... Uh, some opportunity there for them to work with another organization instead of having to send it out, um, collaborate with them. But not, not enough for me to complain about it. Yes. Yeah, no, it's okay. actually pretty great. Yeah. Okay, I, I just got one uh, text to me by Jane. Um, so um, she had my personal number. Um, how can a location, how has location in Marquette, Michigan, a college town particularly, uh, supported the growth of your business or to foster connections with you know, the university uh, how does that been successful, or is there ways it could be more successful? Can I go? Yeah. Uh, I told half of my employees came from Northern. So Northern's been a huge, huge funnel for creatives and dev talent to come through my agency. So we've had a ton of success with interns. Um, and I don't know if this is allowed or not, but I like ping Keith and other professors. I'm like, who's really good? Oh, and I'm too. like, too. who's got, who's like, who's, who are you watching? Um, and because I want the best of the best, you're grooming, to, you're grooming. Mm -hmm. um, and then they come through as interns, and then if they do a good job, a lot of times stay as part-time employees, and then hopefully they stay on full-time. Uh, and so that's been such a great way because it's really hard to find good people. And so we kind of have like two tiers. We have like the grooming path through Northern, and then we have like the we're gonna go out and recruit someone from wherever. Because about half my team is now remote. Uh, and the other half is here at Marquette. So my relationship with Northern has been huge. I don't think we would be where we were today without some of that talent that's come through the doors. Yeah, I do the same thing. I message the professors when I'm looking. You know, we have a graphic designer on staff. Sometimes we have a photographer. I, I message the teachers that I know on campus and ask them, who, who's good? Or you send people my way? Or do you have people trying to move back to Marquette is one that's worked recently. And I, be, I pulled someone from that moved to Green Bay back here to be my graphic designer in-house. So, And she's a Northern alum. Um, and I'm sure that was probably through a, one of the teachers I contacted telling her. <laughs> I'm dropping the Thank ball. You. Apparently, I need to be hitting up There the you school. go. You're going to have to yeah. school. <laughs> Um, but as the city goes, uh, you know, northern side, ju it, it just being a college town is wonderful because it keeps new people coming to Marquette, and those new people sometimes hang around, and then they become young professionals, and they're the ones who are spending money on new websites and jewelry and tattoos. And, and, and forming new cre creative bit venues absolutely. that maybe we haven't even predicted yet. Yeah, what's interesting is we actually have, we have a lot of young people, but we really have a, a slightly older clientele um, in my business. And it's the, the tourists and the people in the gift market. Um, and we do get younger folks for wedding rings and things like that. Um, but the tourists really kind of, people willing to travel to a beautiful place, because why, why wouldn't you want to come here? And then it's just easy to go downtown and, and shop with these other places, or it's a destination and they, they realize we're in a great place and they're happy to come here too. So the, the tourist market's pretty great for us as well. This is quickly turning into like a really big plug for Marquette. Yeah. I don't know if you know well, this, I mean, Marquette I really is just a pretty great Pretty city. cool. It's, yeah. I think it's the, the students also help with like inspiration. Like I think that 
like as I've been doing this for 15 plus years, and you're always looking for places for new inspiration, and, and when you see students with like fresh eyes and things that like I'm not even aware of, and then you're like, wow, that's such a cool take on this, or such a new twist, or like I would not have approached it that way. I think sometimes like that lack of experience can like be more freeing, and students come through with like more open eyes, and they're they're not they're willing to take risks, and they're willing to like break rules because they might not even know the rules. Mm. And so like for me, it's exciting to see things like even those posters outside. I was like, these are awesome. I was like, and then um, like I was like, this is really cool. I, like I I haven't seen this in a while, so mm. or I haven't seen anything like this, so. Uh, for me, that's like a, just a cool way, even if students reach out and I check out their work and just kind of giving them critiquing the work is as much as me critiquing their portfolio is also me stealing ideas from them. Uh, so it's like a very symbiotic thing. Uh, so on that line, uh, how do you guys feel about like mentoring new creatives? Is that something you like doing? Is it something you don't like doing? Is it create competition? How do you feel about that? I, I meet anybody for a cup of coffee and give them ideas, but I find it harder to know what it's like for a startup now after being in business for 12 years. Like I've got ideas, but um, how I started, we were talking a lot about how social media was organic in the beginning and I, I don't know exactly how it is for someone on the startup now. I do know the art fairs still exist and people still shop at them, but I'm not sure how hard it is to get a following online. Um, now we put a lot of dollars behind our marketing. So um, yeah. I would say, I, I, everyone that's ever reached out to me, I'm like, if you ever, ever have questions or concerns, you want to run something by me, like, I'm an open book. And I would say, like, one in every ten do take me up on it. Um, but I, I'm, I have, still have mentors that help me today. That, and so, like, me returning the favor, I feel like it's just, like, part of that cycle. So if I can help someone through one thing, like, I, I'm happy to do it. I just wish more people actually took me up on that offer. Mm -hmm. um, so if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'll, I'll be there. Yeah, tattooing is, is a little, a little more specific, you know, where Beth can maybe give somebody some ideas or a little boost, some mentoring um, in a half hour coffee session. Um, the, still the only way to get into tattooing is a formal apprenticeship, just much like any other trade. Um, and so the the not the burden, that's not the right word, the responsibility that I take on with that, time-wise, energy-wise, mm -hmm. is, is a lot bigger. And honestly, I've just been waiting for that person that I can't say no to for some time now, and it just doesn't happen. Um, every now and then somebody says, hey, I would love to come, and same thing. Well, maybe one out of 10 shows up, and then I show up, and their work ethic sucks, or their portfolio is super weak, or, they're, they have zero people skills or one of a million other problems that, yeah, when that person walks through my door, I'm happy to do it. I think, I think we can, we'll work on that. We'll see who we can get. <laughs> I asked Dan and he turned me down. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, so this next question comes from Dan Corhonan. Cor Cor um, what sort of collaborative content options would you like to see grow in the creative community in town? ways for our other artists to collaborate. And this is a great example. Yeah, yeah definitely. The, and it kind of echoes on the how does Northern get more involved in the, the community. I mean, this this type of event, I think, you know, we've, I was saying earlier that we've probably all been in passing at the co-op while eating lunch, but I've never spent direct time with these two, even though I know that their businesses are the same age. So things like this create collaboration. Mm -hmm. Other than that? Um, maybe. I mean, I thought, like, even, like, what Mike, I know it might be the last one, but, like, what Mike Forrester was doing with, like, the Culture Cult and, like, some of those things yeah. I thought were really cool, just bringing different groups of people together, different ages, students, non-students, different, like, different creative areas I thought was, like, really a rad idea. Um, but that takes a lot of work and a lot of Infrastructure, time yeah. to, to do those things, but even some smaller things, I think, like, uh, I think you need some bigger teams like Northern to rally behind some of those things too. Yeah, so we need some, some weight, some, some muscle, yeah, behind some it. muscle behind it. Um, I think the two he was specifically thinking of was either maker spaces where tools would be openly available for artists that oh. need specific tools. Mm -hmm. um, the other side was uh, sound studios for, I think if he's really into podcasting, I don't know if he's here, I can't see anything in the light. Um, but um, so uh, I think those were two things that I think maybe I do think we're perhaps lacking in town that we could improve on? Yeah, makerspace would be cool. I think, um, you know, the infrastructure, the facility, the equipment, what equipment are you gonna have? 
the dollars that takes are probably the challenges there. Um, but I think there's a gap between um, getting out of school and actually having access. Um, you know, I think when you're using a lot of digital platforms, you're fortunate if you can have a computer that your main tool is that. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're, you're trying to make a whole metal studio or you're trying to set up a wood shop or you really need a full spectrum of tools, um, a makerspace could be really great for something like that. Sound studio? Sound studio too, sure. We, we need more, I think we need more podcasts. We have a few good ones, State of Superior, uh, and of several other ones that have kind of started up around here. Yeah. Just more to talk about up here, I think. Yeah, I think also how the, the makers are set up in the other room over there is a great way to kind of cultivate collaboration. I know Taylor organized that group of people and um, having someone that's younger and newer to that scene finding, you know, some great talent to pull together. I bet there's some great conversations going on between them in that room that might not have happened otherwise, too. So kind of keeping a fresh eye on how you group other artists together, uh, regardless of where they're being grouped. Plus by their work. Yeah, yeah by their work, too. <laughs> Christmas gifts, people. Yes. Or holiday gifts, okay, um, our next question here is um, how to help pr prevent creatives from moving to big cities with more job prospects? I think oftentimes people don't realize there's a career opportunity in my business. So um, I, th I think it's starting to happen more. I have a couple of employees that have been there five years, but that if they're, if they're sticking with it, it, it can be a career. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if you guys have struggled with that. Sometimes they think of it as like a stepping stone to a real job. Um, and so I've been, we've worked hard to try and cultivate that. We have retirement pl packages, we have benefits, you know, we have paid time off. We are a real career. People are making good wages. If they stick with it for, for a decent amount of time, I'm willing to stick with them and, and make it a sustainable living. Um, mm -hmm. You have to trick them. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Because coming up here is, getting people to come here is really difficult. Yeah. Once they've spent any amount of time here, it's a lot easier to sell. Because Marquette, as we talked about, is it's a awesome. very, very special place. And um, you can talk about it till you're blue in the face, but until you, you know, spent a full winter and a full summer, and probably then another full winter, you uh, you won't really know if the, if the person is, is gonna be sold on it. Yeah. And another issue we run into, I don't know if you guys, but um, like the significant other, right? Yeah. Like if, you hire a female, like what is her husband going, then going yeah, to Yeah, the person do? I recently hired, her husband works remotely in insurance, so that's how they could move here for the job, but right. how do they both find a decent job? Correct. When you, re uh, you know, that's hard. I know we've had struggles with that even at the university for sure. professors. Yeah, we, we almost hired a guy, um, and his wife was a marine biologist, and we were like, that's gonna be tough. Like, cause <laughs> she was studying like seals or something, you know, so we're like, it's not gonna work out. We've got but, white fish. Yeah, but that's how, that's how we've actually gotten to more remote talent because just to combat that, but like we, same thing you said, like I have a lot of people that like want to come into entry level position, but they, they say they're like, yeah, I want to work here to get experience and go to California. Like I've heard that a uh, hundred times and we've hired some of those people, but at the same time, if I have a couple of people that are like equal weight, or even if the one person wants to maybe stay, I'm going to hire that person because it's a big investment. Mm -hmm. um, so. But I think it's like you said, that people don't always realize that there are careers, like even for us, maybe because we don't like promote ourselves a ton in the community, but like a lot of the times these students are like, well, we want to work on these big projects. And I'm like, you can for us. And they just don't make that connection all the time. Yeah, they might think, oh, it's a small town. It's a small town yeah. business. They, they don't really realize that you have reached, you know, I'm selling jewelry all over the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think I can I go come back to the idea of like the, the tricking him. One of the goals for this conference is, of course, to bring up more creative business and get more people to realize that this is a special place, that you can be a creative and be successful in this place. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the more we, we have those opportunities, I mean, there's plenty of options. There's plenty of things you can do. Yeah, maybe even more so here than a lot of other places. Yes, the co I think sometimes the college town, as we discussed, helps with that. Um, I think even our remoteness is to our advantage in a lot of times. Yeah, and the, the beauty of the place, and we have a really cool downtown. You know, if you're thinking of places you want to go visit, we have great breweries, coffee shops, restaurants. I mean, that it's a cool place. Buy know? breweries for 22,000 people. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my last scripted question is, uh, what other amenities would you think help support creatives moving to the area? So this person was particularly interested in, in you know, improving the entertainment options so that people would maybe have more options besides perhaps outdoors? 
So. Oh gosh, I think you know there's a lot of events going on. I feel like there's so many events going on, at least in the summer, that I can't even possibly get to them all. There's music, all the. I mean, for the size of the town, it's impressive. I feel like so that one's that one's a, a tricky one. But I think housing. You know, I I think that sometimes just finding the the right place that's affordable within maybe they're hoping for walking distance or you know that can be a little tricky. I think I don't know if I, my employees have directly experienced that though. A um, venue. I know we're yeah. markets really in need of a of a music venue. Yeah, if anyone's out there, we really need a music venue, like a stable that's music, meant venue. To be a music venue. Correct. First and foremost, yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that one. Ever since Upfront closed. Yeah. For those of you who maybe other you don't than know. That, like like Beth and Ben are both saying like what they do, they could do anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like they could mm -hmm. they they don't it's not necessarily true with every creative, so I see how the questions are coming, but I don't think they should feel pigeon pigeon held to not coming to market because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean I even I personally I'm not the most outdoorsy person and sometimes would struggle to, you know, find things. But I've always found things, you know, when I'm interested. Maybe it's not a band that I actually own music to, or which, who owns music these days, anyways. So, but um, you just know, just the experience that you might go check something out that you weren't sure about. But any live music is, I find, more engaging than than just maybe throwing on a on a track. You know, it's mm -hmm. um, there's always an experience. There's a lot of theater. I feel like in this town too. There's always some sort of play going on. Youth yeah. theater, yeah. All, all sorts. It's of stuff. definitely up um, upticked lately. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I think I am done with scripted questions. Is there any other quick, I think we're actually kind of hitting the 15 minute mark. So we see if there's any questions out there and if there's anything you guys want to add uh, and you think we haven't covered. It looks like you got a solid question right there. Pricing, it's, see, it's kind of a journey to land on your pricing, I know. Uh, I know I'm going through that, a lot of people I know are. Uh, can you talk about how you plan, how you develop the pricing that you currently have? Uh, we just keep charging more until people say no. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm, I mean, I'm being serious. Like, we continue to just keep raising our rates. Like. Um, if you somebody, a wise, a much wiser person than me once said uh, that he told me, this is advice that someone gave me, a business person was like, if you don't feel uncomfortable asking for your price, you're not asking enough. Um, and you got to be busy enough to be able to, to sh roll those dice uh, and know the value of what you're putting out. So like when I started to now is crazy the difference of what we charge. Um, but I think it was just like making steady leaps of like, okay. I've, I'm so busy right now that we're turning down work. We need to consider raising our rates, and we'd raise our rates. And then we get to the next point where we're like, okay, we're turning down work, and these are projects that we normally would be like high fiving to get, and we're like, we're saying like, sorry, we're too busy. We're raising our rates, mm -hmm. and that's been like a steady climb over time. Um, and then we haven't reached a point where we raised it and had to go back down. Um, but I think that there's a there's kind of gray area where you're outprice yourself from the competitive market. Uh, but I think that goes to like what we talked about earlier on is if you're putting if you're delivering a product that's superior to whatever else is and you have a value tied to it that is reasonable, um, most people are I think willing to pay it. I think it's pretty easy to pay attention to what's happening in your in your yeah. market, uh, maybe nationally, <coughs> and you can just pay attention to that. We know what what's going on. And then sometimes you do need to adjust because of the city you're in. You know, cost of living isn't the same in Marquette as it is in Manhattan. Um, so sometimes that de definitely needs to be uh, taken into consideration. And just to play devil's advocate against Ben just <laughs> charging out the ears. Um, <laughs> I once had, uh, I had a, 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 a colleague who had ran into some some good success, and I couldn't believe how little he was charging. I'm like, you need to be charging more. And he said, I couldn't afford to, I don't want to not, I couldn't afford to get tattooed by myself. And I was like, touche. That's like a good point. Like, he's like, I, I, I couldn't even afford my own products and if I did that. And you're like, that's a great point. Like, so you also have to be able to sleep at night. Like, you have to be comfortable with what you're charging. Say, so you know what, the, the product that I'm turning out, I feel is a fair price and I feel that it's worth what I'm asking for it. Yeah, and you have to really know your market, I think, in that regard, because 
um, I think a lot of tattoo artists have tattoos, get tattoos, that they're also the customer um, in that realm. And so, you know, I know that our clientele is a little bit older, has a little more discretionary income, usually kids are off to college or done with college, and then we also make wedding and engagement rings that are more affordable for young folks, so they're not having to go buy the $10,000 diamond and the, the fancy gold, they could get a silver one that's going to last a pretty good long time um, and still have that, that symbol that they're looking for. So trying to really understand what your customer can bear and where you fit within the marketplace. I remember looking up some jewelry on um, Sundance Magazine where they have Jess Mahari jewelry and she had these silver rings and I was like, well, I can make a ring that looks cooler than that or just as cool, so I can charge what she charges. And I did, and people paid it. Um, and I have the benefit of like, what's the most expensive piece of jewelry you've seen? Well. Uh, you know, that goes, you can go from a dollar to tens of thousands of dollars. But the way that I literally price, and I, I developed a system in the shop, is that we charge per technique that's been done to the piece. I don't, that, this doesn't always apply to every art form, um, but it was hard for me to track literal time. And so I started to attract a value or attach a value to the process. So if it's been hammered, um, it costs this much, and there's a base price for the size of metal that's there. And if it's got one cut element, there's this price. If it's got two cut elements, it's this price. And so we kind of developed this system that really is based on time, but it was a whole lot easier um, for us to kind of do it on each process than for me to literally track every minute. Now again, we're tracking time. My studio assistant is scanning QR codes to track our time, and so this might be a way that could work for you as you assign um, a QR code to a process or a product that you have, and you can find an app that'll put them into a database and you just scan. And we start and stop a lot of pro projects, but you just scan the QR, and then you know if you're done with that project for a minute, gonna work on something else, you scan it again. And it's working really good. My assistant's cool with it. I don't know if I can get in the routine, but I don't have to, because she, <laughs> she does most of the production and I do the designing. Um, but it's a way that we've figured out to track time that wasn't as painful as literally writing down every start stop minute. She just flashes it in front of her phone, and you know she, we got another scan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, the other thing too is like look at the project for what what it has potential. So we evaluate. Like I mean, yeah, we, I want to charge as much as we can to make the most money we can, um, and also like when you have expensive employees that are working all over the United States, you've got to pay, like, pay them to that <laughs> for that time run. Um, but we evaluate on like multiple criteria. Like, is it going to be fun? Um, is it going to be financially beneficial? And is it going to be um, fan? Like, is it going to be like like bring um, like a portfolio? Uh, yeah, like fanfare. Or, you know, is it could it be an awards piece for us? And so we evaluate. We might take on a project for like a lot less money because it's going to be super fun, and maybe we could win awards with it, and it'd be like a really like awesome creative piece. Uh, if it fits all three of those, we're doing it's a home run. If it fits one of them and it's only financial, that's a tougher because like the team isn't excited about it, I'm not excited about it. Um, and I actually think like a couple years ago, we made the mistake of we had some like really big projects that were really financially lucrative, but we had like nothing really to show. Um, and then all of a sudden people are like, does Elegant Sequels even exist? And what are they doing? Because we didn't have any cool work to show or creative work to show. Um, and when you're a creative agency, it's kind of a real thorn in your side. Um, yeah, the so, classic triangle. Yeah. yeah, yeah so it's pick just, two. Uh, so I think that's like not only about the money, but like fulfillment. Fulfillment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I don't take on nearly as much custom work, so that's probably something we all differ in quite a bit, is I've been reducing and reducing the amount of custom I take, because it was starting to turn into more and more of what I had to do, and I wasn't able to push my designs um, further. And it's a, it's a tricky balance, because I don't want to, I won't cut it off cold turkey. We don't want people who thought they could get an engagement ring to all of a sudden have no option of doing that anymore. Um, so we've limited it to just half of the year and only rings. Um, so I used to do a lot and a lot of custom, and so that's kind of been the way that I've been able to kind to make sure that I'm fulfilled creatively and that I'm following more of my, my intentions um, without just sort of like, yeah, well, they want that really expensive ring, let's do that. Um, you know, it's, it can be hard to say no, um, but that, I guess that sort of segues into this idea of like, you do have to say no um, to things sometimes, which can, you know, that's a tricky thing. But saying no is a, is a good thing, actually, to limit and set some boundaries around what you do and don't do can help you um, follow what you really want to do more. So, with consideration for the small community that we're in and the many emerging artists that we have coming from the school, can you talk about how over or under pricing affects your fellow artist? 
in the marketplace and how we can make that consideration to better support the artists that we work around and with. I, that's a good question. I, you know, I get comments that, my, that oh, that's expensive, you know, on social media a lot. And you know, I think it's really easy to hear that comment as, you're ripping me off. But really it's them saying, that's just not in my budget. And that's the words that they're using to, to express that. Um, I think that I, it's hard to say where everybody should be priced because it really is dependent on your overhead and your cost of running your operation. So someone who's running in their home without any employees can charge less than someone who has a business with employees and payroll taxes, insurance, and all of this stuff. Um, but if you, you kind of have to decide what your vision is at some point and price based on where you're going versus on, based on where you are. Um, and so that you can, you can really achieve where, what you want um, in, your, in your operation by making sure that you have the extra money to then do those things. Um, and so I think it can be hard for people to charge enough. This may be a little bit different than what people said before, but um, you, know, you, may, you may say like, I want my friends to be able to buy my work but you really, it really, you have to decide who your customer is, and your friends might not ever be able to afford your work due to the fact that it just takes more time than they can afford. So, not charging enough will, is a quick way to just like not succeed. Um, so, I think underpricing is is sort of like you you won't last if you don't charge at least enough. Um. Sure. In the in the digital field, I mean, for us, it's um, there's like there's definitely discrepancies between like like an agency or like a solo freelancer and like we'll get requests through like dribble and they'll be like they probably send it to 30 people and so there could be the college kid that's super talented that will do it for a hundred dollars we're like we can't have the meeting for a hundred dollars like it's just a huge difference in like what it costs for that person to do it and it, it is frustrating because it does fluctuate the pricing sometimes and it does devalue some of like the design but at the same time, like when I was in college, I would have done that for a hundred dollars too. And like, I need to, I want to do it. It's a real client. I want to put my portfolio. I want the experience. I'd do it for free basically. So like, um, it's hard to get upset about that from my seat. Cause I was in that other side of it. So, um, it's like a tricky question. Cause it's like, you, you know, what, what it's worth to you to do versus someone that has a, an agency is, is could be drastically different. drastically different, um, which is okay. Sure. I, don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. I do think that underpricing, though, sometimes it depends on the work you're putting out. People don't see the value if you Absolutely. undervalue it too yeah. far, and so if you find that the like when you're trying to charge as little as possible, you, you might get like the pickiest people too, um, which I don't really know why that's the case. Um, but you know, you need the person that you're selling it to to appreciate it at the level it deserves as well, which is, is strange that that comes into pricing. But if they've paid a lot, they'll think it is worth a lot. Sure. Um, you can drive a Ford Taurus or you can drive a Ferrari. Like, they're both cars. It's, the, it's, their, it's their prerogative what vehicle they're going to drive, right? It's, it's, not, it's not your job as an artist to provide the Ferrari for the Ford Taurus price. Right, and like they're, they're different, pro it's, not, it's not the same product. Um, we're fortunate enough that we make something that people don't need to survive. I mean, yes, we need art, you know, but we don't, people don't need a piece of jewelry, yeah. like they need some food. And so I, I think of it that way too. It's like, not everybody needs to have your art. They got to probably appreciate it by looking at it at some point, sure. hopefully, um, but they, you know, you have to make sure that your, your business is sustainable and you can afford where you want to go Otherwise, you'll never go any further, or you'll you won't you'll have to take on a different job if you aren't charging enough. Um, and catering to the clientele that you want. She mentioned um, the competitive side of me wants you want every client. You want you why, don't want to say anyone no. go anywhere else. You don't want to miss out on any client. But you need to recognize that you know there's there's somebody for everybody. You know mm -hmm. that you you maybe don't appeal to everybody. Um, Having a few people in your back pocket that are good, that maybe yeah. just can, you know, offer what that person is looking for, so you don't feel like you're like hard no, and they have nowhere to go, and you haven't helped. You can help by sending them to someone else too. That's that's up and coming. Um, but it would be, it is hard to send someone to someone who is really charging you less than like the cost of materials, maybe. You know, like you know that they they can't succeed that way because you don't want to fuel the failure. Um, so that can be. A little bit hard when you're really vastly underpriced. But we were all there at one point. That's too. true. So it's like, they someone's going to come to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
my question is a little bit more for Ben. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the remote worker um, and that landscape right now and how um, people here in Marquette can work remotely and find businesses like yours who will hire remote workers. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we made the our first remote employee we probably had like five or six years ago and it was someone that was an employee of mine that wanted to move back to Detroit area because of family things. And so I was like, I can't leave this person. And like, they're so good, like, let's just try it. Um, and it really just comes down to like, I think you have to have re really good communication skills because there is that barrier of like, you aren't there. And so your communication has to be like really sharp. And I think that there's a lot of tools now, um, like we use Slack and things like that. So we're like always in constant contact. But I think when you're looking for like remote positions, like there's all remote companies, like Envision, for example, like we used to do a lot of work for Envision and like their entire team of like a hundred some employees is all remote and they're paying the same price as like the Bay Area. So you can get like a really, really super good job and work in Marquette remote for these companies. Um, I think it's just the remote landscape is more competitive because like there's, everyone wants to work remote. Um, and I think if you do work remote, it's just making sure that like you're, you don't take advantage of it. Cause I've had employees that I know take advantage of it and it's pretty easy from my seat to see when they do. Um, so I think if you just treat it like you would any other job and how you tackle it day to day, um, you, you'll be fine. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> um, okay, so. When did you know it was right to scale your business or hire an employee? Or how did you prepare to having an employee or an associate working under you? I feel like every time I thought I needed to hire someone, I probably was already like past that point. <laughs> like I probably was like, I think I need to hire another programmer. And I probably like realistically needed them six months ago. You needed them training um, today. Yeah, right so. Like, I think that's like just, some of it's gut and a little bit of like leap of trial by, yeah, leap of faith. Like your first, my first employee, like I won't lie, I was freaking out because I'm like, what am I doing? I can sort of busy. And um, I was just kind of like going for it, um, which is probably not the best like business advice, but that was like what I did. I don't, I mean. I think it's less about the, like if you're having any kind of, any kind of inclination, it's probably time, but more importantly is then finding that person. Because mm -hmm. as I'm sure anyone up here will attest, like good help is hard to find. And until you're a business owner, you, that those words don't ever ring that true. Mm -hmm. um, but if if you feel like you might be there, then what's the harm in like starting getting those steps in motion? Yeah, and for me it was that I realized there was more people wanting what I was doing, and I couldn't produce it more. And um, it took me several years to realize I needed a whole team of people in the office running the, the whole operation, the business, the marketing, and the sales, um, so I could actually get back in the studio. Um, but my, you know, Mike, my part, significant other, helped me in the beginning, and it was just kind of off the cuff. I didn't know anything about business. He was sanding edges of metal, and then helped me set up my art fair booth, and you know, helping tear down setup. And then I, after that, you know, we realized, eh, working with each other, we want to be together, but we want to work together. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, that's special, you know, to spend all of your time together. Um, and then I, I hired a friend, and I did, her, I did it as subcontracted labor, which was probably a bit of a mistake, but I was a little bit afraid to take on payroll. Um, but if you're going to set someone's schedule and their hours, that's an employee. That's not a subcontracted employee. So talking to your accountant to make sure that you're setting up these relationships appropriately and that you're um, getting your unemployment insurance and your payroll all set up appropriately. So having the money to do it, I think, is probably the first thing, is that you can afford to do it or you can borrow to kind of bring people on. Um, and a desire to have more out of it. Maybe you, you feel like you're, you're sort of just like churning and you, it could be more. And I thought I started thinking, I could employ people. Like, people could have cool jobs in Marquette and I could make more of my art. That sounds like fun. And so, you know, you have to sort of know what you're, you're wanting and the end result of that hiring. Either it's going to help you complete the work or you're going to be able to further a vision that you believe in. And depending on the field, I mean, I don't know what your field is, but uh, you can dip your toes in. So, like, my first employee was a part-time employee. Oh, yeah. uh, and it was still in school. So, like, he was still in college and he was a part-time employee. <laughs> um, and it was a good way for me to, like, okay, like, I can keep this person. And then I had, like him going and I hired another person. And so like, 
you can kind of like test it out. You don't have to just dive in and be like, I've got three employees and they're all oh, expensive. Yeah. That would be like, kind of scary to hire um, three. Yeah, I mean, so you can start small, start with part time. I mean, fear is so crippling, I think, especially in this industry where people are just afraid to step out because of the fear of failure. There's always going to be more money to be made. You know what I mean? Like, what's the worst that could happen? Like, you still have your health. You know, you might have a family around, all these other things in life to help fulfill you and carry you. Like, take the chance. Like, what's the worst that could happen? Like, you lose you're, all your money. You know? Well, you're well probably right back where I started. Yeah, just, yeah, take the other. <laughs> it's like a choose your own adventure book. Like, oh, I guess I got to start over. I'm going to take the other path this time. But, like, it, it really is, I think. Um, so many people are just afraid to take that step because of fear of stability, fear of failure, fear of all this stuff. And you're like, what's the worst that could happen, really? Like, you'll and maybe be okay. To counter that slightly, but I do agree with it, is just making sure that you can afford to keep that person and have the, yeah, you know, just go, just go willy nilly and just hire, just hire oh. about 10 people tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, we were saying that the whole time with this conference. Like, let's just see what happens. Let's just see what happens. Well, and when it's brand new, you have to kind of take those yeah. leaps. You really do. Um, but as you grow and scale a business, like b being calculated about it and making sure that you're you're bringing in the revenue and that you've got the plan to to get the the income to support that team too. But yeah, at some point in the beginning, it's a leap of faith, right. and you have to be be almost stubbornly adamant that it'll work. You know, when I opened my store downtown, I had a friend say like, "How do you know it's gonna work?" And that was the first time that thought occurred to me. I was like, yeah. I don't know, I know it's gonna work. I just know, and I knew I only had to sell like one piece of jewelry a day because I had rentals in the back to make it work and I was already doing that. It was just an easy choice at that point. So, um, but I probably could have used more help sooner. My, but my first employee was literally, she worked every other Saturday or every, every other Thursday or something. So it was really barely, but it was a huge help. I was paying mine with tattoos and Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, yeah, I was I was uh, I, I was bartering bartering with my significant other. I'll, yeah. I'll buy food if you can help me. You know? Yeah, she's talking about obviously part of owning a, a small business is once you have all these people on you, there is the burden that like <laughs> this thing propelling forward is not just it's your not own me. life. Yeah. You now are responsible for these other people's lives. But when you're early on, nah, just pushing your chips. <laughs> so we might have, I mean, we're a little over time. We might have time for one more quick one, if somebody's got one. Uh, so this is directed towards Ben and then opened up. But you mentioned um, earlier that over-delivering was an in integral part to starting out and that you still hold it true in your mission today. Um, and I'm curious about how that maybe worked with your budget, I guess, starting out with not undervaluing Um, so this is maybe too much transparency, but I'd say almost every project that we still do today, we go over budget. Um, and the ones that we don't is like a real success. Um, <laughs> but like, I think that over delivering is like every project we have that has the extra bells and whistles or has like the little bit more motion or has this extra attention to detail is what gets us our next project and has got us the next bigger project. Um, so that Without doing that, I think we would have probably plateaued way earlier. Um, and a lot of that is probably on me just wanting to like do like, oh, what if we did this or this could be really cool? And, and just wanting to do that just because I'm passionate and excited about it. So like the budget is always in the back of it, uh, of my mind. And I think actually like the team almost takes it like they're like, we're over, we're over time on this. I'm like, yes. I like, it's cool guys. Like, I like keep going. Like I want you to do this. Um, so like the, it's always a factor, and you want to be cognizant of like when you are really tipping too far over. Uh, but like I would say, I would say like the budget comes like second as far as unless we're like really just blowing it up. If it's just going over, we just we just do it. Okay, I think we're good. Unless you guys have anything to add. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I got my notes here, and <laughs> the only other thing that I'd really like. If there's any takeaway, it was it would be as artists. I think we all can relate uh, to this relate relatable. Um, is that authenticity? How important it is, but also how apparent it is. People can pick up on passion. It's contagious. So I think being honest with yourself and and if this is something that you're you're genuinely passionate about. Like you wear it like a like a 
blanket. People will know. And, and that's contagious. People want part of that. And that's part of, you know, as much of marketing as we're doing everywhere else is, you know, that's the, yeah. one of the most important marketing tools you have is yourself. And the, and the fact that if you're genuinely passionate about what you're doing, people know that. They'll, you, they'll smell it on you, right? And so, and when it's not, it even smells even worse. <laughs> so, um, I think I think that's just super important to remember. Yeah, I'm always saying show your passion. Like that's just half the battle, at least, if not two thirds. Which I'm sure these guys will attest to. Like second to the product, then would be the experience. Mm -hmm. So your customer service um, has to be the, the best. It has to be better than stellar. Like mm -hmm. it, it just has to be. Like the, the one without the other doesn't exist. Um, but they, they need to be equal, the, the product and the experience. And I'd say, that, I guess the only thing I would end with is just like have fun with it too. Um, like I, I treat every project almost like it's my own. So like I think about like, okay, I'm doing this project, like what would I do? And put in like, and I just try to like have fun. I think a lot of the people just take it, they get so caught up in like some of the minutia and the, and the other stuff, they like lose fact of like that it is creative and it is fun. And I think when you're having fun and you're excited about it and you're engaged with it, like that's when you put out your, like, your best work. Um, I think kind of like pushing on like your comfort zone and that goes to like the over delivering thing is like people might be expecting X and if you show them why and they're like, oh my gosh, like I was not expecting this, but I love it. Like to me, that's like the best feeling in the world. So like if I do something above and beyond or outside of what they asked for exactly, cause I just think it could hit their goals and objectives even better or tell their story even better. Like I'll do that because I can always go back and tweak and, and dumb down the design. Um, or whatever it might be. So like, I think that's just like, make sure you don't lose that, the fun side of it um, when you're designing or being creative. Yeah, hopefully we over delivered on the conference. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Oh, I don't know if I have any follow up <laughs> okay. exactly, but uh, yeah, just that takeaway of, you know, under promise and overachieve is really important. And um, yeah, you know, really loving what you do um, and trying to, to, to be optimistic. Um, cause it can be easy to be like, Oh, this thing's going wrong. I might be guilty of it lately, but I'm, you know, working on that, that, um, finding the good and the best parts and focusing on those and building them and, and, uh, appreciating all the people that will allow you to do what you do too. is really important. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, all your time and yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll be back in here at six o'clock. Or, or yes, yeah, six o'clock for the last two keynotes.